Everybody and welcome to Lost in the Groove. Today we have a special guest. His name is Andy, and he's here to take us into a little bit of a time travel. We're going to go back to the '90s. So, with that, uh, Andy, welcome. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Good. So, tell me a little bit about yourself. Who is Andy? Well, I'm a writer. Um, you know, I I like to tell people that I used to work in a cubicle, which is true, and um, ended up making my once my hobby into my career as a writer. So, you know, I've worked <clears throat> in college, you know, I worked in just the worst restaurant jobs you can have, you know, <laughs> everything from the uh, the deli owned by the, 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 the a-hole uh, uptight, super per- perfectionistic deli owner. With all of these kind of deli, like all the above is the worst place to work. Um, washing dishes at a general restaurant and then got out of college in the mid nineties when uh, it was kind of a switch uh, you know, my, my parents had always told me, well, you, you, you study hard, you get a degree, you'll get, you know, this big, glorious corporate job after you get out. And that kind of changed in the 90s. Like, it was really, I guess, the first throws of the gig economy. So anyway, I, I got a job at a bank. I did the business thing for a while, learned a lot, did a lot of great things, and kind of there's always had this undercurrent of being a writer, uh, you know, and, and just ended up making it my main gig now. So I write about sports business for Forbes. Um, prior to that, I did about six years with ESPN and wrote for Rolling Stone a little bit and put out a novel last summer called 90 Days in the 90s, a rock and roll time travel story. And it's all about, uh, you know, someone who's my age, who's a record store owner, who time travels back to the 1990s and kind of gets lost in the music scene in her 20s and having a little bit too much fun, you know, doing the things that we all sort of remember that we did when we were younger and more carefree. Well, I mean, the 90s was really an honestly crazy time for music. Well, first off, people don't remember this. There was a Woodstock that ended horribly. Then there was Lollapalooza. Uh, Nirvana was a thing, and they had their insane concerts where people were literally banging their heads against the railing because they were depressed and angry. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a different time. It was uh, you. You were right. Like it was the beginning of you know gig. Um, what did you call it? Gig. I, I I talk about the gig economy a lot because one of my one of my three or four jobs now is I teach digital marketing and okay yeah so I, I kind of say to the twenty somethings who are in my class like okay you grew up with the gig economy it was kind of a new thing to have like a side hustle like we didn't say high side hustle but yeah you, know, you had like two jobs just to pay your rent and eat ramen noodles every night and that really kind of started uh, you know the world sort of changed from go to work for a company for twenty years or thirty years get the company watch and a pension to well, you know, here's a job. Good luck and try to make it make it through. And if you don't like your work too bad, go find a, a hobby to keep yourself sane. So that really, I think, started or became more normal in the 90s. That's why I kind of always said the gig economy is, you know, kind of the first throws of that. And you mentioned co- uh, Music Fest. Like the 90s was a growing pains of Music Fest. Like now we have Riot Fest. We have Bonnaroo. We got, you know, we can make fun of it, but you've got Coachella. Um, every major city, like, Louisville has their thing and Austin has a couple of them and Portland and Eugene or like came out of the nineties. Yeah. I mean, really like we were kind of figuring that out. We, we had Woodstock in the sixties and my parents, I suppose could have gone to it. And in the nineties we said, yeah, they're getting a bunch of bands together, like thousands of people in the sun without sunscreen and alcohol water. That's a really great idea. Why don't we do excellent genius. And, uh, yeah. So yeah, you mentioned uh nineties, 90 Woodstock 99, which was really like dude bro bands and, in any even less preparation, but you know, it, it kind of grew out of the nineties. And I think we, I think we've figured it out for the most part. Since I then. think we, I think we have, but you bring up a really great point because when we look at, um, when we look at celebrities like rock stars, you know, especially the ones that came out of the eighties and nineties, which a lot of people listen to now, a lot of people listen to bands such as, um, Aerosmith, Black Sabbath, Iron Hello. Maiden, Hello. all of these. Hello. Among the millennials. Um, but these, a lot of these bands, like you were saying, the, these were people that when they started off their careers in the 70s and 80s, late 70s and 80s, they were they were starving artists. You know, they were working h- tons of gigs, traveling constantly just to make breaks even. And 
I think you're right. Like a lot of that started to change in the 90s. A lot of people started to see that there was a different way of how to do this. You didn't need the man anymore to yeah, make a living. That, you know, so yeah, I think the 80s, I think of like these mega artists and not you're going to knock on them, but I mean like Springsteen and Prince and right. Madonna and David Bowie kind of had his rena first renaissance. But uh, I remember like, so I used to watch, I still watch sports, but I watched a lot of sports in the 80s. And I remember Miller High Life had this, this series of commercials where they highlighted like up and coming bands. And one of them was the Miller, Life. like the, the beer company yeah, high life. So basically like okay. Miller high life on the road with this band you never heard of. That's really doing kind of the American dream thing. So one of the several bands that they picked was the mighty, mighty Boston's, which I think they were just called the Boston's at the time, you know, okay. playing, their, playing their ska, wearing funky uh, suits with, you know, tartan ties and stuff like that. Right. And then, you know, fast forward to, I think 96, they have a number one album and it's like weird music like that was mainstream. And everybody accepted that, you know, there was room for artists that weren't Madonna or weren't huge like Prince or, or, or Springsteen. You could have, you know, all kinds of uh, artists from all, all over, over the place. And, you know, maybe the 80s kind of it was an undercurrent of that. But yeah, I talked about, talk about music all day long. I'm not I'm not by any means a uh, expert or a music historian, but neither am I. We all overtake. So. <laughs> It's just, you know, it's just a really, um, it's just a great thing to think about because music really shapes our culture. And being that you're, you know, you're a writer and you're somebody that gets to talk and be able to put down on a piece of sheet of paper, like explaining, you know, showing people, kind of opening people's eyes to something that they wouldn't have seen before. There, there's something really incredible about an author because you have the ability to sit there and write something, inspire other people, have people be engaged in what you're creating. Um, there's something really, there's something really beautiful about that. That. Well, thanks. Yeah. Well, of so course. One, so one thing that Gen X, uh, we all kind of grew up on TV, and we, we all we, we we read books too, but we grew up a lot. I think visualizing the world from TVs and movies and stuff like MTV. And so what I always write in the book, you know, first thing you you do is you try to figure out whether or not you can write a book. So I'll, I'll fast track this by saying I was influenced by a handful of movies in the nineties where um, you just hang out with the characters in the movie. So like Pulp Fiction was like that. Friday was like that. Days Confused was like that. Yeah. There's <clears throat> probably you could figure out a lead character protagonist and some things that were overcome, you know, some, some ups and downs, but by and large, in those three movies, and a lot of movies were like this in the 90s, and maybe books were like this in the 80s, like you just kind of hung out with the people who were the characters and felt what they were feeling and became part of their conversations. And that was really what I went, once I kind of figured out what I was doing in writing 90s days in the 90s uh, and wanting to make it about music, that's kind of the, I guess, the theme I tried to follow. And I think I mostly pulled it off. But, you know, it wasn't about uh, explaining, as you to use your word, it's more about come along for the ride. And I think that's how we did it. I think that's even better. I mean, cause like if you come along the ride, you don't know what you're going to expect, but come on, it's going to be fun. It's gotta be. Yeah. Unless you're completely boring or you're square and don't want to take any, any risks. Um, you know, when I first shopped the novel to, uh, to literary agents, a lot, I get a lot of like, you know, there's, this is a quiet novel. I'm like, not if you get past the first 50, you know, like, agents want you to send like the first 25 or 50 pages. So with your, um, with your book, you said it's kind of like low key. What, what do you mean that it's like low key? Yeah, I think it's just, um, you know, when you're writing a book, you're, you you spend some time trying to figure out how to do that. And then you go, Oh crap, I got to write, you know, 70 to a hundred thousand words and, and make it readable for the audience. Not just cool stuff I'm putting out on a page that inspires me. So, um, I don't know. I, I was told that it was kind of low key in that um, I think it, it has a soft takeoff, maybe. And I, I would think that So I, the thing about time travel is in every movie that we've seen or every book we've read, it is. You know, there's a, there's a, a problem, obviously, that Marty McFly or Bill and Ted or, or somebody needs us to solve. And there's also this big thing where they've got to make sure they still exist or, uh, it, you know, in, in other ones. There's you got to prevent JFK from getting shot or you got to kill Hitler or something like that. And I thought about the fact that if you or I could time travel, we would probably just go back in time and do some things that were fun to us or see some things that were familiar or um, maybe go see a show or, or experience, 
something that in the past was fun and uh so, yeah i don't... would i would honestly for me if i can go back in time i know this may sound very cheesy i would go back to woodstock okay to experience it not to yeah. better woodstock or to prevent woodstock from happening or or to make sure that Jimi Hendrix played earlier than like yeah I think he played at like five in the morning because everything was so behind like you wouldn't I would be to, there at four forty five okay correct. well the thing is like you wouldn't need to correct it you're not like oh crap no. we got to fix this and we got to make this better no. we got to make sure that Vietnam doesn't happen and we got to make sure that uh, George Wallace uh, you know gets uh, off so that he doesn't do these horrible things like it's more like I would just go <laughs> back know. and experience some fun things and take in the experience so that was sort of what I wanted for the book. I mean, there are some some subplots and some things that Darby, the uh, main character, has to deal with. A lot of it's about her dealing with her personal shit. But yeah, and then the other thing is like, she goes back to kind of fix some things and gets caught up back in time just experiencing and loving the moment. So there's a good and bad that comes with that. But I think most people, and that's maybe what makes it chill. I just kind of want you to hang out with the characters and come along for the ride. And when I was kind of beta testing this with my friends, my friends, we like read five books a month. I said it to a couple of them, like read this, tell me if it's good or not. Um, but more than anything, tell me, do you feel like you're hanging out with the characters or do you feel like you're a third wheel and you're not included in that? Cause that was really important to me. And they all said, yeah, I kind of felt like I was hanging out with the people, whether I knew them or not, or whether or not they're people I would hang out with, like I was along for the ride. And that was what I went for. Well, you um you mentioned earlier uh, a bunch of movies that you felt inspired to, such as like Days and Confuse and Pulp Fiction. Yeah. I feel like for me, the experience that I got out of these films was just enjoying the ride. We're OK, I'm going to use this as an example. If you take a movie like Pulp Fiction. It's insane. Like you have characters that are they're not crackers like these are people that have mental illnesses, 100 percent. But. They're so fun. They're so fun. And it's like each scene you think you know what's going to happen. But no. No, it just out, out of nowhere, pure insanity comes out of just um, thin air, as you would put it. You know, it's it's all about just getting in there, reading the story. And then coming out of it and being like, what the fuck? Yeah, I guess if you were on a stakeout, if you were working for a gangster like uh, Marcellus Wallace, you would you would need somebody like Samuel L. Jackson's characters to be, you know, kind of driving for you and 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 sort of getting business done. Right. Uh, I never thought about it like that. Yeah, I mean, but the thing is, like, if you worked at Burger King and he was your manager, you know, like either you'd hate it or enjoy it, but like shit would get done. You wouldn't. It wouldn't be like, oh, I got another four hours before I go home. Um, you know, your manager would come in and you, you, you know, you'd learn to make the burgers right, right. Or you'd be out of there pretty quickly. Right. So I don't know. I think there's something to strong characters, whether they are strong characters that are type A and yelling at you or they're super chill. I can think of like Slater and Days and Fuse. Like he doesn't really do much, but hang out and maybe philosophize a little bit and smoke a bit of weed. Um, but he's not a weak character because he doesn't save the day or because he's not you know, hooking up with a girl. I think that he's not are. supposed to, he's not supposed to save the day. No. And not everybody has to be Marty McFly or, I mean, Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. I love that movie in, in part for a lot of nostalgic reasons, but that they're the most unlikely heroes that kind of pull it together on their own terms to make that story in the movie work. And, uh, you know, it's a great history lesson to watch that movie too. If you didn't know who Socrates was, you probably want to know, you know, who he was just to figure out yeah. what to do with that character wearing the robe or whatever. But yeah, I mean, um, you know, there's, I've, I'm a, I'm not a huge TV watcher, but there's, I've tried to watch shows like 24, like, cause it's, a, it's on Amazon or whatever now. And it's like, I don't, I can't relate to Jack Bauer enough to really connect with what's going on, but I love James Bond films probably because he likes to drink whiskey and you know, he's, uh, he's got a, he's, Martin. Come on, when yeah. he gets in, when he gets into that Aston Martin, you know, and he's just like speeding down the highway, you're like, oh, well, James Wan means well, business. Yeah, but he always has time to like if he's in a nice hotel, like it, J Daniel Craig James Bond. He has time to hit the pool before he's going to go on some stakeout to do whatever. So uh, there's something about that that I think is more relatable than 
TikTok, TikTok. I gotta figure this bomb out before. Oh, let's go to commercial. See you next week. I don't know. I want a little bit it's more. It's a different. Uh, it's a di- okay. Look, the way that I view it is like this. We we I can say this because we both experienced this. When we wanted to watch a movie, mm-hmm. we for me as a kid, we had two options. One, you would go to the movie theater, yeah. okay, or you can go ahead and pick it up at a blockbuster and rent it. Yeah. Uh, and there was always option three, which you always can watch it on Showtime or HBO or whatever, but we didn't have any of that. Um, so it was a very physical experience. If you wanted to do something, you had to do it. There was no, like, open up your phone and then it's right there. So... I'm not saying that it was better. I'm just saying that I feel that it changes and gives you a little bit more of an appreciation because you're now investing your time in this. You literally just drove two miles to pick this thing up. You want to invest in this for like the next two hours. And maybe it's it's conditioned how we consume music now because so my parents, I presume, went to the drive drive in. I went to a drive in once or twice my whole life because they didn't really they were, I guess they weren't profitable. And yeah, I mean, I think we went to see some boring ass movie and then that weird turned around. I remember seeing like some like rip off of ET and the feature that was showing behind us was this terrible movie called hard bodies, which was like the most sophomoric misogynistic, stupid movie you could think of. I looked it up afterwards. Um, and I remember just seeing like boobs every 20 minutes and, uh, great movie. Yeah, you know, 13. Right so I, I tried to turn around. I was like, what, what are they watching behind us? But <laughs> Yeah. So now like, but, but, and then also at the same time in the eighties, at least like you'd turn on the radio and if you don't like what's on the radio, then you probably end up listening to alternative music or finding a college station. If you're sick of Bon Jovi four times a day or every hour. So I think it informs like, I've got a 16 year old son who likes a lot of the music that I like. And and when he was like 12 or 13, we both signed up for um, paid Spotify accounts. Cause to me, it felt like going through the record store where you could listen to something, really see if you want it, want to listen to it or not. And so I see him and his friends, and I do live in the city, and I know that he's attuned to my music too, but I find that Generation Z is a little more curious than maybe even my generation, definitely more than millennials, about searching out like, oh, I like, um, you know, I just, I'll give you an example. Like, uh, I, I, I like I like the artist Sky Ferreira a lot, and she's, you know, she's not definitely not as famous as like Taylor Swift, who's in town in Chicago tonight, this, right. this weekend, by the way, or Britney Spears. I think she's better in terms of her songwriting. But so she's a little dark. She's a little kind of, I, I found, yeah, it could be the weed and she's a little bit bad girl, but I found other artists that sound like her. Like I just found this one yesterday. Oh, let's, let's, let me go look up her name now. Well, I think there was um, Cal is her name. And then I found like there's a there's a Austin based artist named Aria. And there's one in LA called Caroline Love Glow. And they're all kind of like, the downbeat alternative with a little bit of pop. You can listen to it if you're just kind of pensive or you listen to it if you're stoned, if you want. And it's not in your face as much. And now I'm I, like, I know there's got to be at least another dozen artists that are the same um, approach to music that I want to find. And I love that about Spotify. And I love that, you know, younger, the youngest generation that's into music right now is like curious to find out like, oh, I like Dinosaur Jr. So they're kind of garage rock. So am I going to like stuff from the, late sixties that I can grab on Spotify and make a choice to go check out versus just turn on the radio. We'll listen to whatever everybody else is listening to. Anyway, that's my thesis on music right now. No, I, I, I completely agree with you. Like I, I love hearing and experiencing other artists. I've had other artists on this show. Uh, I had recently uh, a few weeks ago, I purchased a guitar mm-hmm. and the gal that helped me out. Uh, she's a singer, a singer and songwriter. And she does, um, ultra, I think it's alternative pop. I, yeah. I don't want to misquote, but her name's Leah Sim, uh, Simmons. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is amazing. This is totally like you get a little bit of early 2000s, you get a little bit of 90s, a little bit of country. Mm-hmm. It's um, It's really great what technology has allowed us because just like Spotify, it's that allowed her. you. That her? That's her. That's Leah yeah, Simmons. Uh, She's. I'm gonna check it out. Um, I like it anyway. So, so she sold you a guitar. Do you know how to play guitar? Yeah, yeah, I do. Okay, um, I've been learning how to play guitar for the past two years, mm-hmm. and I just came to the like the realization that it's it's time for a new guitar. I need something a little heavier neck, a little bigger body. You know, 
they're like tattoos. You grab one, you're going to, you're going to see one in the garage sale that you don't need that you can afford. And then you're like, well, I like strats. Maybe we'll get a Mexican Stratocaster. Cause I hear that they have a special thing. Like I, we're, we're that like that in my household. So um, yeah, I totally get it. You know, it's, it's a good hobby to have, I think. But it's even better when you're able for me, when I was able to make that connection with that person, um, I, I just, again, like, I, I feel that there was a lot of benefits growing up, but there's a lot of benefits now. Like, we could, you could use this as such a great tool. You know, like you were saying with your son, you're able to bond and be able to experience all of this music. We don't realize, I, I didn't realize how much I had it at my fingertips until I was like, whoa. Yeah, I mean, it's. It, it, I think the world has always been user friendly for those who get off their get off their seat, and you know, I think we hear we could listen to probably my grandparents or you know, your grandparents be like, "Oh, Woodstock was the greatest, and it's never going to be like that again." You know, like, but last Sunday night, um, you know, because it was Memorial Day, there was no school the next day. Uh, there's a band called the Subhumans that was in town. These guys are like probably 62 or so, UK band that kind of was cut from the cloth. Of the Sex Pistols, but but you know, kind of started after they broke up. And that sounds like, so. Hold on, so, I this sounds so, so familiar. Yeah, go on. Yeah, so imagine you know you got an old Cockney guys on stage. You're like, fuck the Queen and or the King, I guess now. Uh, you know, and they're talking about um, worker conditions and corporate America and the late. This is it. Like, Wait, eh, eh, let me see. Eh, after, yeah, yeah, that's after, them, yeah. So you know, I'm talking about. Yeah, that's totally them. So it's it's I'm talking about the time that, you know, when I was Ooh. crowd surfing and I actually got dropped on my head, uh, seeing a band, a band in Cincinnati. I'm kind of saying to my my son, like, don't go up there. There's going to be some people moshing or slam dancing. It's going to get a little rough. Don't feel like you need to do that. You're not allowed to do that while while you're here with me because I don't, you know, because as a, as an as a sports writer, I've interviewed professional athletes but i've also interviewed athletes that like have had spinal cord injuries and i'm like you don't go up there just like let's enjoy the music yeah. and then shit gets a little wild up front and his one of his best friends who's also 16 goes up and starts slam dance with these people who are like you know built like linebackers and just so that was our sunday night entertainment to see like 13 bucks to see this band from the early 80s who are waxing po poetic about you know worker conditions and f this and f that it was great it was like so authentic to see that this band is still doing the same things that I assume that they were doing in 1981 and 82 at some crappy bar in South London. Uh, they haven't changed. And the crowd is sort of a mix of people my age and, you know, my son's age and, you know, everything in between. And, you know, it's, it definitely wasn't um, a bunch of people sitting down with their arms folded, just listening to the music. It was, it was pretty, pretty live for it was you. You're a part of the music. Like you're a part oh. of that experience. And, I, I will say this, like you, you talk about the subhumans, you know, like the dead Kennedys is a great example of this. You go to a dead Kennedys concert. First of all, it's not that expensive. It's actually pretty affordable, which is crazy. Yeah. And you get to see Jello Biafra like on the stage, looking like a fucking demon, you know, screaming on the mic. Yeah. And you're right. There, there are ways of you still like being a part of these experiences, like being a part of the music. Yes, Woodstock may never happen again. Okay, boo-hoo. But we can make other experiences. We can enjoy other types of music. And people that have been fucking rocking since 1983, honey. Yeah, I mean... I love uh, that. Keith Richards is still alive, and I think Jerry I know. is still alive, too. So it's like... Um, yeah, there's... I mean, I think that... You know, I, I grew up so... in. Oh, I'll, I'll say this. In the 80s, it was kind of like, this was us, Generation X... Like if you were into the cure or the Smiths or Who's Could Do, like you would never say, like, oh, I really love that Death Leopard song. I kind of like like <laughs> some metal. It was just something you didn't do. And now we're, we're way past that. But um I love that. It, I, I love not, that finally somebody admits to it. It was kind of comical. I mean, it was be like but I, I mean, part of it was that you grow up with what you are spoon fed and what you know. And and so a lot of time, you know, like I'll I'll put it this way, like before I knew about alternative alternative music, I loved Huey Lewis and the News. And it's still like their music is still great pop. It's actually like there's a lot of bad pop, but Huey Lewis and the News is kind of middle two or three albums are like it's good songwriting. It's great pop. And I know they're not touring anymore because Huey Lewis has basically gone deaf, but it must have been a fun show as an adult because 
you know, I, I would go if they're still playing, just like I would go see the Subhumans or I would go see Sky Ferreira if she'd ever start touring again. I hope she does because I've never seen her. Do you know, by the way, do you know who I recently saw in concert? Blondie. Oh, nice. You saw them? Yeah. I yeah, saw no, her on I saw her on stage. Scene. I mean, they're probably like the same age as the subhumans and they've probably hung out drinking in the uh, same bar back she's, she's in her eighties. No, she's not she can't be that old. Debbie she, Harry? I think late seven I think late seventies, yeah. early eighties. Yeah. Well now you pique my interest. So I want to know. Yeah, she's she's gotta be like pushing my dad. I, I I was Harry. like 77. Yeah, she's 77 years old. Yeah. She's almost she's yeah, and I'm like she was up on that stage twirling. Okay? Twirling to Rapture. And I was just like that is fucking music. I have two of their um vinyl records. Nice. And you know I I love that. I love that experience of these artists that just they do it because that's what they do. That's what they do. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, it's, it's uh, I do like that Bruce Springsteen is still doing it. It's, it's funny, a couple of years ago, I was in New York with my family, and, um, and I think, let's say it was about five years ago, so I think it's pre-pandemic. Anyway, Bruce Springsteen is playing nightly at the Walter Care Theater, which is in what used to be Hell's Kitchen, and now it's a little more more upscale. And mm -hmm. my, my kid goes, we should see Springsteen while we're here. I'm like, do you have $1,500? Cause I don't, cause that's what the, that's what it was going for. Like, yeah. ago. and I'm glad that he can do that. But at the same time, um, I'm, I'm glad that he, like he is a premium artist that he is doing these small, like instead of doing giant stadium, he's doing these, you know, these, these smaller venues that, you know, I mean, yeah, it's, there's a price to pay. Um, it's probably not all that he's doing. Just you like, know that you know Go that ahead. John. You know that John Lennon predicted that Bruce Springst Bruce Springsteen would be like huge. Oh, and <clears throat> yeah, he did, and it was really crazy because I was reading that and like, oh. <clears throat> sorry. I mean, you're right. When you take like some of these celebrities, I just recently saw Aerosmith take. This is crazy. Um, Aerosmith is coming down here to Florida. Okay. okay? They're charging $995 for basic seats that is in front of a giant television. Hmm. $995. Kudos to them. I'm just saying that, you know, you know, I'm happy for them, but it's a lot of money. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, that's the good thing about these music fests is that, I mean, yeah, it might cost you 125 bucks to get into Riot Fest for one day. I usually pick a day that I that, that I go to see all the artists. You do get to see a lot, and you do get your money's worth. And, you know, I'm probably, I don't know, I remember I remember Fire Fest several years ago where it was like all this money to see all these artists that were going to show up, and then the whole thing fell apart. <laughs> uh, great concept, not executed very well. Don't know if they'll ever do a uh, music fest on a, Bahamian Island some at some point. But yeah, I mean, it's like I, I was complaining that New Order a couple of years ago, it was probably going on 10 years ago when they were, Peter Hook, I think was still involved, that they were charging like 200 bucks for tickets into like a, a large theater here. And um, I was kind of complaining like, you guys are greedy like Steely Dan, but you know, at the same time, it they got to make, you know. You know, the biggest, you know, the biggest problem with New Order though is, is because of uh, what was his name? The the uh, um, Ian Ian Curtis. You know Ian Curtis when they when they originally like were formed before he passed. Mm -hmm. You know a lot of their fan base stems mm -hmm. from there. And after he passed, you know these people pass it over to their kids. You know because that was the music that they listened to, mm -hmm. and then you had New Order, and then people started to get along with that. Um. The biggest problem I always had was like you had like the two sides because it was a very big issue with them. It's like, hey, you know, remember where you came from? Remember yeah. who started you? So, you know, know? You're, you're kind of getting there is a new order crowd that's very much a Depeche, Depeche Mode fans. Yes. And then there's others who are more Joy Division who. Yes. I mean, they're probably not going to play transmission or uh atmosphere as much it's weird i've heard a couple of punk bands play covers of atmosphere one was like codeine who hasn't recorded in a long time to cover atmosphere which sounds just like the original yeah it's beautiful that, but i mean it's like uh, like i love slater kinney the last time i saw slater kinney was like 2003 
Now the tickets sell out so fast. It's because people know them from Portlandia, and I'm glad that they have a following. I'm not going to complain about be like, well, I was in this Claytor Kinney before they became famous thanks to Portlandia. I mean, I do like the earlier stuff, everything from the woods on from about 2005 on. Yeah, but people really, really got it. people so really they, got a ta- people really got a, a new taste of what they were doing from Portlandia. Like, I yeah. know this because I've I had a friend that was really into this music. She was telling me that you know. It's like some people prefer bananas, some people prefer strawberries. You know, you're going to take what you want. You can either mix it or choose either or either. You know, it's like it is what it is. But so I like the bananas before they were fully ripe and now the super sweet overly ripe bananas aren't really my thing. But, um, yeah, um, if, I, if I get a chance, if I ever even actually get the tickets before they sell to see Slater Kenny again, I know they're going to play stuff from their second or third album. They're not just going to play their most recent album encore i don't know cover of a Sheryl, Sheryl crow song like they're not built like that and it's just the way i'm glad that they get to be artists and keep doing what they do instead of um not that there's anything wrong with it but like buffalo tom they're not going to tour anymore um bill janovitz is doing his real estate thing up in boston and he uh, they it probably will tour again they'll probably do a small tour um and i'll not get tickets to the show but you know there's different very art- th- Go ahead. i feel like though there's very few um Maybe this is just me. I feel like there's very few artists that came out of that period. Okay, we're talking about like late 70s, 80s, or throughout the 70s, whatever, um, that kind of like was able to stay in their realm yeah. and be able to continue with that. I mean, there was David Bowie, but he passed away in 2017. There's Elton John, but after what happened with him and Dua Lipa, I'm just like, uh, I-, I don't know. Well, there's, I mean, okay, so that's with big, big artists. But so yeah. the, the English, the English beat comes here to Chicago um, in normal times. I mean, they're probably starting to come back like every, like twice a year. And I don't know if Dave Wakeling has like a girlfriend here, or if he's just got buddies. Like, why Chicago? Why Milwaukee? Because as I, he'll introduce the band, and he, like he still lives, I think, in the UK for the most part. He maybe right. Isn't, but but like his his drummer, I'm just going making this up, but I mean it's like pretty close. It's like his guitarist lives in LA. The main drummer lives in San Francisco. Um, you know, the keyboards live in Boston. They all assemble when it, it's time to do a stateside tour. And it's kind of cool to see that. Marcy does the same thing. Like, I had a friend who lived in Wrigleyville who uh, I remember one time we're standing. This is in like the mid 90s. We're standing outside of her house on a Saturday. Someone's playing drums. I'm like, what's going on here? It's like, oh, that's the drummer from that that band that has a song about like, I feel like a newborn baby. I'm like filter yeah, filter <laughs> drummer from Chicago. Like when they're not touring, he lives here. Um, can't remember the drummer's name, but now he plays with Marcy. And I know that Marcy doesn't live in Chicago and, and maybe the drummer lives in LA now. Um, but yeah, they, they kind of assemble their band and do like clockwork. They got it down. The musicians are good enough that they can just pick up wherever. And um, you do, I mean, I am seeing a lot of like very late seventies, early eighties, stuff revived you know an artist that maybe aren't as big as david bowie and and maybe new orders right. now but they're they're still out there i mean that's the cool part about all these different levels of music and different size venues is that okay you're maybe never going to see culture club do what they did in the early 80s again if you get boy george in a good mood to tour with the band and they they're getting along and they don't cancel the tour in the middle okay so maybe you don't get but you know the go-go's will do a west coast tour and um english beats still out there and uh you know there's all kinds of different artists that you just got to kind of put your feelers out and then you see like oh crap i didn't know this band was back together like and i missed them what was i thinking you know, that's the cool part about being a music fan i guess well, the thing is you mentioned like with the uk so here here's the deal though i feel the uk is one of the coolest cultures for music because a lot of these old bands they're still very true to what music that they make and what mm-hmm. happens is, and I've seen this because I have a friend that's out there, they, there's these little groups, like little bands that pop up, and they emulate those, you know, whether it be um, post-Soviet punk, um, ska punk, or just different genres of music, even metal. And you can find them, like, anywhere on social media. They're not, like, big, but they're all inspired by this, like, culture of music it's just a weird place. It's just a weird place where music came from. Yeah, now you got the Future Islands who are from Maryland. Um, their lead singer half the time is singing with a fake German accent. Um, I mean, I think that they're 
musically adept and they've got to think, well, I'm kind of like, why, why are you singing with a German accent? Dude? You're not German. Like, I don't. And some of their fans are like, you don't get it. So shut up. I've really like wrangled with Future Islands fans on social media because I'm like, yeah, this, this guy dresses like an accountant and he sings like he's German, but he's not. But I mean, some people like they, their shows sell out, like people follow them. And maybe if you're into synth pop, you got a hankering for a German accent every once in a while. I don't know what it is. So I'm glad that nobody's like nobody from the U.S. is touring or doing records with like the fake English accent singer. But I've seen Swerve Driver and like when they talk on the mic and they're like, oh, this is a lovely venue. It's great. Thanks for coming. And then like when they're singing, they sound like these kind of chill dudes or just have an American accent that you know, they're kind of dark and I love their music, but I don't know if they're putting it on or it's just a style of singing that, yeah, I mean, that's, you got to be game for that if you're a music fan too, that you're going to hear a techno band with a fake German singer or a Germanish influenced singer who's from Maryland or, you know, these guys from England who wish they're from Southern California and they got, got they had dreads. Now they don't have, so I'll, I'll give you a funny story. Years ago, I went to see, um, I had a friend who was, uh, my friend Mogan is is like a roadie basically, and he was like a stage manager at Metro. And he put out on Facebook like, "Hey, I I got access to Social Distortion. Who wants to come with me?" I'm like, "Dude, me." So we saw him at the House of Blues. Um, it's funny because like the next morning we were so hungover separately that like you didn't we remember that much. But we're we're on a we're kind of like a box. Like he had great seats, mm-hmm. and we're, I'm looking down at the crowd, and it's you know it's people like my age, and you could tell it's all a bunch of guys who. Do, who used to have pompadours. Like they still comb their hair back and they still got some hair, but they're mostly bald. And, but they still got like the black t-shirts and they still look like punks. Like, yeah, there were a lot of former pompadour people, you know, like people who got dudes who used to slick back their hair at the show that don't really have it, but anymore, but they're still showing up, showing up the show and still seeing the same band. It's just, you know, it's nostalgia, slightly bigger, man, slight, slightly bigger venue, slightly less hair on the, on the top of the head. The best thing, the best thing that I ever saw was I went to a venue here in uh, Fort Lauderdale, mm-hmm. and it was a uh, was punk, and there was a guy there. He was seventy two, okay, and he, I remember I walked up to him. And he's like, "Listen," he says, "I've been to Studio Fifty Four. He says, "I've been to CBGBs. I've seen the Ramones live." He says, "I don't care if I got back problems, knee problems." He says, I'm going to get my ass out whenever I can get to a punk show. And I was like, bro, that is a life. Can you imagine you're 72 and you just keep on going at it? Good for him. Talk to me in 20 years. I mean, I remember uh, a couple of years ago before the pandemic, I went to Speed Weeks um, NASCAR in, in uh, Daytona. I'm on the oh, airplane. Nice. I'm flying coach. I'm sitting with this guy who looks exactly like Childish Gambino, Donald Glover. And he's a little short. I mean, no, it's not him, but... At the end of the flight, we're getting ready to land. I'm like, I know you get this all the time, but you look just like Childish Gambino. And he's like, oh, yeah, I kind of know his music. Not really. I am a musician. And we talk about that for a few minutes. I'm like, oh, what do you do? It's like, oh, my band's, I'm part of this band that I joined a couple of years ago. We're here to play Pensacola. I'm like, oh, what's the name of your band? He's like, Steel Pulse. I'm like, oh, that's why there's half a dozen old guys with dreads all over this airplane. The guys who are like my dad's age with long dreads, like Steel Pulse, one of the legendary, you know, British reggae bands, second wave of reggae. Like these guys are legendary and they're just sitting in the airplane next to me and around me. And I was like, huh, that's what life is like now. I'm, I'm, I'm on a plane with Steel Pulse and we're pulling into Daytona. I couldn't see the show. I had something going on that night, unfortunately. But um, damn, yeah, that was just like, that's That'd be so about. real. Like, dude, I, I'm a, yeah, you know, I flew to Daytona. I got to interview Chase Elliott and, you know, and then I'm, Steel Pulse is on my plane. Like, I mean, I, I feel know. though if you went to like a Steel Pulse show, it'd be so cloudy, just the amount of smoke. Yeah. From I think the they're jo- a small club. Like, I don't think that they're playing a huge venue. I don't, I don't know exactly where they're playing. I could probably look it up, but I'll be honest with you. Reggae for me, it's not really great in large, it's great in outdoor, like large venues, but indoors, it's better when it's small. Yeah. I don't know why. It just, well, same with the subhumans. I mean, I was at the Cobra Lounge and it was standing room only. I wouldn't want to see them in a theater with seats. That would completely suck. Mm-mm. No, no seats. Yeah. So. That's yeah, well. weird. I, I there are some like shows I've been to where there's seats and like I don't want to sit 
Yeah. I want to dance. Why, why are you giving, why am I paying for a chair? Yeah. You're not there to see Kenny G or, you know, David Sanborn. So I don't know. You probably get lots of that in, uh, in, in Florida though. Like uh, some people with a lot of, a lot of, uh, smooth jazz and bad taste in music, but I'm glad the punk comes down and the reggae is there and you just maybe got to look a little harder to find it. Well, if you don't. Yeah. Garbage is coming. Um, garbage is coming out, which is really cool. I, I, I didn't get tickets, but, uh, there's a club out here. I think it's called a culture club. Uh, they have a lot of, um, punk Soviet punk, um, like Depeche mode kind of style, uh, like new wave. Mm-hmm. and freestyle and stuff like that and there's a lot of, there, there's there's a lot of culture that's coming back like i i totally can hear like people shifting to that sound to that feeling there is this like wanting in a way of going back to the 90s yeah it's well, kind I of think part- we we can bag on streaming and spotify we know that you know the with the artists get paid in terms of royalties is not great. Cause I mean, like you and I can just access what we want uh, on Spotify on demand, but they're really getting the same, same royalty rate as something that comes on randomly on the radio. Um, but I do feel like it's created this diversity in terms of what is well, like our, our musical interests and what we're more likely to go out and listen to. I think a lot of people can't speak for everybody, but it's more diverse than what it was in the eighties. And even in the nineties, like I remember uh, I like shoegaze music. I remember loving when I heard it come out, uh, Chapter House. You know, it was like on college radio in '91, and then it wasn't played anymore. And I, it was years and years. I mean, I think you, you'd have to go to a big record store in a college town, you know, like the Princeton Records Exchange. I grew up in the East Coast, or Amoeba. Tower Records, and, uh, where I grew up, we yeah, Tower you, Records. You even find that now, you know, you can order it online. I, I, I do buy some things, even though now I don't have a CD player anymore. But you get to you, you can stream it and you can listen to it. Whereas it was really difficult to find something that wasn't major label or even in the '90s. You know, I guess uh, the major labels had their punk labels and you know kind of did that song and dance for a while. But you, there's so much more that you can find out there and listen to, and so many different sounds. And it does encourage these artists to play shows when they know that they've got whether it's just you know around where they, they live. If it's an LA band, maybe they're not going to come to Chicago, but they'll tour the West coast or an English band. Like, I can't say that I think that chapter house is ever going to come to Chicago, but I mean, they're probably, if they get it back together, they, you know, they could sell out some shows and make some money and play their music. And I think that happens a lot because we have so much, many more avenues now to discover and listen to music that uh, it does kind of take the stuff that was in the back seat and all, on dust on the shelves and all that to uh, bring it. So, you know, curious people like you and me can listen to it now and jo- not just only listen to Taylor Swift. Cause that's what else on the radio. Now there's anything wrong with that, but there's so much more to music than the, the top, you know, 40 artists. Right. Out there. there. There's um something that I really like love, especially about culture, you know, because, you know, down here in South Florida, there's a lot of hippies. There's a lot of uh, reggae, a lot of ska. There's a lot of geeks and nerds and people that just want different things. So you get a lot of quirky stuff that comes out here. Interesting music, old bands. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, it sparks creativity, you know, um, especially like when you're an artist, it really helps you engage and helps you. your helps your imagination kind of flourish and grow. Um, I find that just to be absolutely amazing that we're able to do that now more than ever, you know, because I can say when I was a kid, you were very limited of what you heard and where you got your information from. And I do have to give props to some creative people. Like I don't, I'm not a super fan of stranger things or of Kate Bush, but the fact that they put her, her song on their, uh, an episode of, uh, last year's stranger things. And now all these people, all the people all over the world are like, whoa. I re- either I remember the song it was great when it came out or what is this I want more of this and you know now Kate Bush is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame we can argue about whether she should be there or not or I, you know there's a lot of great artists well, she was not- um, she was a very interesting artist because she started her career very young so um, her first song I think was Running Up the Hill 
not running up the hill. Uh, it came out in 1977. I think she was around like 17 or 16 years old at the time. Her whole story is very controversial. So there's a lot of benefit to this because it raises awareness for this person, mm -hmm. you know, in her career and what she went through. Mm -hmm. um, because she wasn't very big in the 80s at all. Yeah, she was in the kind of the college radio circuit when this woman's work came out. I think it, um, I, by the time I probably heard it in the U.S., it was like seven or eight years old or at least six or seven years old. Yeah. And then they kind of, I remember, um, so an artist that probably isn't famous anymore that was famous in the 90s was a, an R&B singer called Maxwell. Very extremely handsome. He actually had MTV Unplugged did like their own version of Maxwell Live. And one of the songs that he played was this woman's work. And he talked about Kate Bush how great she was and how influential. So I'm wondering now that there's this whole, you know, younger generation of Gen Z who have watched Stranger Things, they've heard that song, they know who Kate Bush is, how many of them are going to be like, I want to do a song like her. I want to find more artists like her that I can listen to. And that wasn't really on the table, you know, a year or two ago because, uh, you know, again, like her, her singles were maybe a little dusty on the shelf. And now there's this whole, you know, I guess, wave of people who know that she, know who she is and what she's done now. And that's going to have an effect in music, hopefully, at some point. Well, there's no more pushed agenda because now there's freedom of creation. Because now you can, you can experience anything, any type of music that you want. You want to talk about Dusty Shells? You can listen to music that was recorded on an old camcorder. I'm serious. I saw this on YouTube. It was taken in 1981 of a band in CBGBs. It's shitty. The quality is garbage. We were able to see this band that no longer exists. Probably all the members, unfortunately, passed away due to drug mm -hmm. abuse. Yeah. But you can go online and watch this. You know, think about going back 20 or 30 years ago. No one saw that clip except the guy that recorded that. Yeah. You know, and the people that were there that night. Um, yeah, I've, I've gone and you, uh, a friend of mine was like, check out this 1980 show, 82 show, Bad Brains at CBGB. And I thought, like, I'm not going to be able to find this. And it was, it was right there. And I'm watching it. I'm thinking, like, there's people, you know, that, like, this is 1982. That's a long ass time ago. I was 10 years old when that happened. Of course, I wasn't going to go to the show when I was 10 years old. Um, but then it, it caused me to go, like, watch Live Aid because I watched Live Aid on TV. I was really into, for a short time, I was into metal. I love Judas Priest. So, like, if I remember right, it was, like, Joan Baez comes on stage. This is this high noon, high noon in Philly, because I grew up in the Philadelphia area. Mm -hmm. Joan Baez sings a song or two without any instrumentation. Then Billy Ocean comes on. Okay. Then it was on TV. The next thing that was on was Judas Priest in their leather with a friggin' motorcycle on the stage. Oh, that's beautiful. Like, Harley? Ocean, the Black Billy Harley? Ocean. Yeah. Like, and, you know. Oh. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. I think it's a sexy Rob motorcycle. Halford, Rob Halford was out to, among people who knew him, but probably most metal fans didn't know that, like, no shirt, leather vest and studs, you know, like Marlon Brando hat, um, you know, that he was kind of showing off his culture there on international TV. And I'm like, Judas Priest rocks. <laughs> um, yeah, that was just that that was uh, so eclectic as a as a music, as a music fest, I guess, or just a, you know, a concert series. But yeah, I mean, I go back and watch those things now. Sometimes if I can't sleep at night or I'm just interested, it'll be like, I wonder if there's, uh, you know, if I, that show that I saw there. So I'll give you an example. So I saw Fugazi play in Chicago here for $6. When my friend got the tickets, I was like, you really $6? Really? That's it. There's, there's no, he's like, what well, year no, was no. this? Come on. What uh, year was this? I think this was in 1998. Um, if I remember right. It was, Six bucks, really? So, well, Fugazi does the whole thing where they they really circumvent um, Ticketmaster. They would play at a high school gym if that's the venue. So, there's a place. Oh, that's why. Okay. Yeah. So they played the Congress Theater, which was open sometimes and was probably in need of repair and had amazing acoustics, even though there's paint falling off the ceiling. And uh, yeah, they you know they don't have like a huge lights and sound system, and they sounded great. And it was six dollars. I got to see Fugazi play, and so um, my best friend who I went to the show with was like, "Oh, I found it! I found the show we went to." I'm like, "Are you sure it's the show?" And like, I I guess I watched it on YouTube, and it was you know as best I could remember it, you know, like guys on stage with like lights over them, not flashing lights and concert stuff. It was just like 
yeah, like dudes hanging out in your basement playing a show. That's what it was like. But it was <laughs> amazing. Their sound was actually amazing. And I got to watch it again. And it kind of took me back to, you know, you don't remember everything, but you kind of can remember how you felt and estimate, you know, the songs you remembered. And that's part of getting old. But it was, it was like I was there. I was there for a minute or two again, watching the show that I was actually at in 98. How crazy is that you're able to experience that? Yeah. It's kind of out of body a little bit, but yeah. um, you know, it's, it's, it's great. It's, it's, we can bag on uh, media and technology. You know, there's a lot of bad things about it, but um, yeah, I don't know. So what's AI going to do? Is AI going to create this reality, virtual reality where actually actually like be standing at the show and see the, the band on stage. It, well, if that happened, it would be strange and cool. And we'll just have to see what happens, I guess. Well, I think of it as like Star Trek. Okay. You have the hollow deck. All right. I love, like, I, I love the holodeck because it's so cool. Can you imagine? <clears throat> you can go into this thing and you're like, computer, program simulation, you know, and you could program which person, you know, you can have Neil Simmons, uh, you could have um, anybody. I mean, you, you could be in that concert if you want to, you know, you could just be like, take me back to this. And then you're in the concert. Um, I think I probably will be long time dead before that even happens, but, but it's a dream. Yeah, I, I want to jam with um, Eddie Van Halen, and I want ja Janis Joplin to sing with me, and I want, um, you know, I don't know, uh, Taylor Hawkins on drums, and I want uh, Charlie Mingus to play bass with us. Okay, go, like, I don't know, I suppose that that's um, conceivable and crazy at the same time, and maybe I have no business being there, but <laughs> I guess that's... Uh, We'll see. We'll come back from the grave in 200 years and see if people are doing that. Just, you know, jamming with Charlie Mingus, Nettie Van Halen and Janis Joplin. And, you know, this is like an AI experience. That would be um, that would be a really crazy experience to meet like Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin. Yeah. Because like, here's the deal, y'all. These are they, they were like unnormal artists. Yeah. Yeah, they, they they definitely broke some ground for sure. Yeah, and it's just I don't know. I just find it I find it very interesting when I'm listening to music. I want to understand the artists that are behind it. You know, I want to know like who made this. Like whose whose genius idea was this to put this thing together? Well, you mentioned English culture. I mean, we remember that Jimi Hendrix had to go to the UK to get a record contract, which is and so did Chrissy Hines too. I mean. I think Chrissy Hine wanted to move to move to the punk scene in the late seventies. Anyway, um, definitely watch the series called Pistol, which was on uh, FX. If you haven't seen it, because sh she's profiled in it. But I, th I, I mean, I've always been an Anglophile. I've always thought like some of the best music really comes from the UK. Like, why is it that American blues found its way in rock and roll through the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin, and some you know, we idiots in the US didn't figure out? that until someone else in the uk did it i think there, there may be distance uh distance creates some um 2020 vision i guess at least it did in the 60s that the, the, these aspiring rock and roll artists thought of saw all this great blues music coming from the u.s and thought we could do something with this or we want to emulate it you know and there's a whole slew of british artists that do blues in rock better than americans ever did i don't know so. Well, Led Zeppelin, I mean, you want to talk about Led Zeppelin? Psh, I don't think there's been any band since now that has done what Led Zeppelin has. I mean, I have every single one of their albums. It, It's just, it's a different time. I really feel that um, the culture that you're surrounded by really shifts the way that you think and yeah. the way that you create. And I feel like that's a very important part of understanding where music culture comes from. Yeah, I think that what is one last thing I could say, I, as I, I can attest to Led Zeppelin, is that so kids who are playing guitar, you know, both boys and girls and everyone else, and, um, you know, they're not trying to learn how to play Foster the People or Glass Animals, not knocking on those artists. Like, they're trying to learn Led Zeppelin, and they're listening to Jimi Hendrix. And their music is, you know, I'm 51 years old. Their music is older than I am. And so the mu music that is 55 going on 60 years old, is still the standard if you are trying to learn how to play guitar, uh, whether you're 12 years old or 35 or eight or 50. Um, that says something about the music, the quality of the music. 
And um, I'm not, that's not for me to say that, well, old music is better than the crap that's playing today. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that right. there are standards, standards in certain things, certain traditions in music that aren't broken, that have not been bested by new music. And I, I think that's, that's the way it should be, maybe. Yeah. It's just a, it's just a way of a different perspective. Um, Andy, I have to say it has absolutely been a pleasure to have you on. Um, it's just in, in just incredible. Like there are things about music. I had no idea. And I just learned them today from you. So thank you. Uh, let me ask you something, uh, for any of our listeners, where can they find your work on um, like your book and the stuff that you're doing? Yeah, so my, my book, uh, 90 Days in the 90s, a rock and roll time travel story, is very music heavy. I mean, you don't, it's not like you need to be an expert on Fugazi or Ned's Atomic Dust to enjoy it. I try, like the movies we mentioned, to make it very accessible and make it, you know, you can tag along. Uh, you find it at 90days in the 90s.com if you're in the US. Um, order it for me directly, I'll sign you a copy and send you some swag. Or you can find it on Amazon. Uh, you know, if you're one of the people like like me and you want to support your local bookstore record store they will order it from you or for you and they can definitely get it uh otherwise you know fo- follow me on social media if you want sporty fry f-r-y it's fry with an e i'm on twitter and i'm on uh insta as well and I'm starting to put up some more music related content just you know fanboy shit and uh you know things that are very nostalgic so yeah follow me on social media or 90s and 90s.com or uh you know, my book's out there, and if you're in Chicago, I probably will be at a farmer's market or music fest sometime near you. I love that. And definitely check out Andy. Um, I mean, his work is incredible, and I honestly cannot wait to read this book either. It seems so cool. I'm like, oh, my God. Uh, so for all of you all that want to um, learn more, uh, be sure to like and subscribe. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and YouTube at Lost in the Groove Pod. So with that, uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Stay groovy, my friends. Adios. Rock on.